If you grew up in the 80s and 90s, then I'm pretty positive that you've either seen or heard of Growing Pains, Punky Brewster, Jaws the Revenge, Land Before Time, and All Dogs Go to Heaven. You've probably also seen Judith Farsi, even if you weren't sure who she was or what her tragic story would ultimately be. All right, let me warn you in advance that this story will involve talk about DV, so please take that into consideration before you decide to keep watching. A beautiful and talented young girl taken by the hands of her father at just 10 years old, a promising future ripped away, a life of fear and paranormal activity. I'm here to break it all down for you, but we have to start at the very beginning. Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, it truly, truly is. Before we get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so because it really helps me out. I really, really appreciate it. Okay, Joseph Barsi. He was born on November 26, 1932 in Hungary. Joseph's father had abandoned him when he was just a baby and growing up, he never knew him. It is speculated that Joseph hated his mother for allowing his father to walk out on them. And his daughter would later come out to say that she believed this played a huge role in her father's issues with women and how he saw all women as nothing but whores. Along with this, Joseph also suffered from social rejection, bullying, and alcoholism later in life. And so when he would go to school, kids would make fun of him, always, always make fun of him. And my father had absolutely no self-esteem. The only time my father really felt like he was a person was when he was drunk. After escaping the 1956 Soviet occupation, Joseph would flee from Hungary to France, where he would meet and marry his first wife, a woman by the name of Clara. The couple would go on to have two children together, a son named Barna in 1957 and a daughter named Aggie in 1958. Then in 1964, the family decides to move to New York. It was also during this time that Joseph's drinking problem would increase. Along with the mental and physical ABUSC of not only Clara, but also his children. So at this point, this was all too much for her. So she packed up and she took her kids to Arizona. Joseph initially followed her to Arizona and begged Clara to give him another chance, promising that he would change. Not surprisingly, it wouldn't take long for things to go to shit once again. He used to threaten us all the time too about burning the house down. Us and burning the house down if we left him or if my mother tried divorcing him, that he would kill us all. She told me over and over again that she was afraid. And in 1969, after Joseph threw a cast iron skillet at her, she filed for divorce and she never looked the following year, Joseph would move to California and become a plumbing contractor. Fast forward to 1976, Joseph would begin hanging out in a bar in Los Angeles that was known to be a meeting place for immigrants. A waitress there by the name of Maria was also a Hungarian immigrant that had also fled during the Soviet occupation. Maria had gone through physical and psychological ABUSC at the hands of her father, and she had dreams of becoming an actress and had finally been able to put her messy divorce behind her. Joseph would initially grab Maria's attention 
because he would always pay for his drinks with $100 bills. Side note, friends, not all that glitters is gold. Joseph and Maria would marry in 1977. Not long after this, Maria gave birth to the couple's first and only child on June 6, 1978, a little girl that they named Judith. Judith's favorite colors were pink and purple. Her favorite flower was a sunflower. She loved the Care Bears, the Smurfs, learning to knit, and Alf. She loved to ride her bike and play with her dolls. Favorite subjects in school were art and social studies, and her favorite food was macaroni and cheese. During this time, Judith's parents were struggling financially, living in a tiny apartment and getting assistance from the state. Maria had always wanted to be a star, but after realizing that that probably was never going to happen, she decided instead to start grooming Judith to become the star of the family. She would teach her manners and etiquette starting at age three. Judith had a one in 10,000 shot of becoming a star, but Maria didn't care. She had an obsession with having her child become a, a star. That's all she really thought of. And in 1983, at the age of five, Maria's hard work would come to fruition when Judith, would de when Judith was discovered at Skateland in Northbridge. Judith was adorable and she was so loved that it would take her only one interview to be signed with Harry Gold Associates Talent Agency. All right, so I don't even know if you know who I'm talking about yet. And truth be told, I, I didn't know this story. I knew Judith Barcy from one thing, Jaws of Revenge, because it is one of my favorite movies. And I also, she was so cute in that movie. I had no idea about anything else. And I was kind of the 80s and 90s, so I've probably seen her a hundred times and it just never, she never stuck out to me, except in Jaws. Anyway, though, she starred in hundreds of commercials, including McDonald's, Lay's Potato Chips, Rocky Road Cereal, Sugar Free Jello, and Jif Peanut Butter. She made appearances in TV shows that included Growing Pains, Punky Brewster, and Cheers. And she also starred in movies that included Jaws of Revenge and the movie A Family Again, premiered on October 15th, 1988. She was the voice of Amory in the animated film All Dogs Go to Heaven, which aired on November 17th, 1989. And she was the voice of Ducky in the film The Land Before Time, which aired on November 18th, 1988. Tragically, Judith wouldn't be alive long enough to see her last three movies premiere. As Judith Barcy's career began to take off, she was earning an estimated $100,000 a year. So I would double, if not triple that in today's standards. And she was doing all this before the age of 10. All this money that Judith was now earning allowed her family to get out of debt and to purchase a three bedroom two-bathroom house on McHale Street in Los Angeles, California. So you would think at this point in the family's life, things would begin to start looking up, especially because we all know that money problems are a huge, they can be a huge, huge problem and burden on families. But you'd be so incredibly wrong. After the purchase of the home, Joseph's anger, jealousy, and paranoia went into overdrive. And not just over Maria, as one would expect. He was incredibly jealous of Judith and her success. His alcoholism got increasingly worse, and he would end up getting three separate DUIs as a result of it. He would also threaten to unalive Judith, Maria, and himself on several occasions, and threatened to burn the house down with all three of them inside of it. In December of 1986, Maria would report his to police, but after no physical signs of ABUSE were found, Maria decided 
to not press charges against him. Joseph, on top of all this, he refused to let Maria have any privacy. And this included reading any and all mail that she received. So there's a story about a letter that Maria receives that's intercepted by Joseph. The letter was to inform Maria that a relative from Hungary had passed away. Joseph allegedly hid the letter from Maria so that she wouldn't leave and go to Hungary with Judith. Especially because, well, number one, he didn't want her going anywhere. But if she left and she went to Hungary with Judith, what if her family convinced her to not go back to him because he sucks? So it's unknown if Maria even knew that that family member passed away. Like if she ever even found out that the family member had passed. June 6, 1986, Maria celebrates Judith's eighth birthday at a bowling alley with a bunch of her little friends. While at the party, Maria confides in one of the mothers that Joseph isn't here because he decided he would rather stay home and get drunk. Another time, one of Judith's friends came by the house to see if Judith was able to come outside and play. A little girl by the name of Trixie. When she went to the door, Joseph answered. And when she asked for Judith, he responded, Oh, that little ass, she's at a photo shoot. <sighs> Another time, family was having a party at their house. Joseph would become enraged at the attention that Judith was getting. So enraged that when Judith walked into the kitchen to get a drink, Joseph followed her, grabbed her by her ponytail, and threw her down to the ground. The following day, he would go out and buy her a pink television for her bedroom to apologize. Meanwhile, he probably bought it with Judith's money. 1987, Judith is nine years old. She's in her bedroom packing for the Bahamas where she would be for the next few months so that she could film Joe's Revenge. While Judith's in her room packing, Joseph walks in, he puts a knife up to her throat and he tells her that if she and her mother don't come home right after filming this movie, that he's going to cut her throat. Before they left, he came into Judy's bedroom closed the door and took this kitchen knife and uh, put it against her throat and told her that uh, if you and your mother don't come back after the shooting, uh, I'm gonna cut your throat. Then he turns around and he walks out of the room. <sighs> Maria and Judith leave for the Bahamas. Filming, Maria would begin to make friends with a lot of the women on the set. And because, I mean, I guess side note, because Judith was little, she was only allowed legally to film for a couple hours a day. So there was a lot of downtime for them. So she would get close with a lot of the people there. And as time went on, she would begin to open up to them about her home life. The women would beg her not to go back to him. And they tried to be there for her and they tried to help her through her situation. However, because Maria was constantly changing her mind about going back to Joseph, the women stopped caring about her situation, believing that she was just doing it for attention and describing her behavior as the boy who cried wolf. After she was just constantly crying out about how concerned she was and how threatened she felt almost to the point where nobody took her seriously. It was like, oh, here goes Maria again, just worried about uh, going home to this crazy person. After filming for the movie Wrapped, Maria decided to take Judith to New York with her to go see her brother instead of going straight home like she was ordered to do. So when Maria fled to Los Angeles, her brother fled to New York. So she hadn't seen her brother in years and years and years and Judith had actually never even met her uncle. But Joseph would end up tracking Maria down at her brother's house. And after a brief phone call, 
Maria decides to cut the visit short and fly back early. In the fall of 1987, Judith starts fourth grade at Nevada Avenue Elementary School. Judith would tell her friends about the ABUSC her and her mother received at the hands of her father. One instance including a nosebleed after her father threw a pot at her. But the effects of Joseph's treatment towards Judith would go so much deeper than a nosebleed. Judith would begin to put on a significant amount of weight. She began pulling out her eyelashes and she began pulling out her cat's whiskers. Then during a singing edition for All Dogs Go to Heaven, Judith would break down in front of her agent, prompting Maria to seek professional help for her. And this breakdown is not described as like kids have a meltdown. It's described as an actual breakdown. So bad that it was a singing part and it was so bad that she could not get through it. And the studio would actually go on to have somebody else sing that part. After meeting with Judith, the child psychologist would diagnose her with severe physical and emotional ABUSC. Whatever the psychologist saw was alarming enough for her to call CPS and file a report on Judith's behalf. When an investigator went to visit with Maria, she assured her that she had already rented an apartment and that she was in the process of leaving Joseph and taking Judith with her. Satisfied with her findings, the investigator closed the case. Okay, to be fair, this was the truth. Maria had rented a $700 a month apartment in Panorama City. The social worker has received a lot of backlash for closing Judith's case after what happened. Okay, first of all, we all know hindsight is 2020. Number one. Number two, this social worker, I think she had like 20 more cases than she was supposed to have. She was incredibly overworked and she was looking to drop cases. Also, Maria assured her that she was leaving. She just was getting divorce proceedings underway, that she had an apartment, which she did. So, It's very split. Again, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I'm not a social worker, so I can't speak on social workers. I do know they're very overworked, underpaid, and underappreciated, like teachers. I guess everybody's opinion is their opinion on it, and I'm quite positive if she knew that this was going to happen I don't think that she would have ever closed the case but they have received a lot of backlash for it regardless of whether Maria's intentions were real or not that would all come to an end when Joseph found out about her plans as Maria began to slowly move things out of the home and into the apartment one day when she was bringing over boxes Joseph follows her. When he confronts her about what she's doing, she tells him that it's a friend's apartment and that she's just helping her move in. All right, so Maria gets caught. Now she knows, all right, she told him this story. He claims to believe it. Friends are telling her, leave anyway. And I was trying to tell her, you know, get out, go. The house is not important. Just take Judy and be safe. And she says, no, you know, they've worked too hard for the house. The house was theirs. And if anyone was going to leave, it was going to be my father. Well, she's scared to leave now because now she's like, well, even if I leave, he's going to know where that's going to be the first place he goes is the apartment. So friends are telling her, go to a different apartment, go somewhere else. She decides that she would just try to force Joseph to leave. So apparently Joseph is an incredible neat freak and he hated when things were out of place. So Maria decides to just stop taking care of the home and herself. She stops doing her hair, she stops doing her makeup, she stops dressing nice and she stops cleaning the home. The home becomes an app 
absolute pigsty. She let the house get so messy. I mean, it was disgusting. The first thing I said was, let's clean it up. She's like, no, no, because it'll drive my father crazy. That was what her world words. It's going to drive him crazy. It'll drive him out of the house if we don't clean up. So it was a pig spent, a living pig spent. But if she thought it was going to be that easy, she would be so dead wrong. Joseph would also begin seeing another woman. And we're not talking about a fling here. We're talking about a full-fledged relationship. He would buy her gifts. He would take her out. And it was probably all on his daughter's money. It was also during this time that people were still trying to help Maria. One neighbor even offered her home to Judith and Maria as a safe home. But Maria declined. Okay, here we go. It's widely speculated that Maria didn't want to give up the three-bedroom home or the money or the things and have to start all over again from scratch. If that's true, it's so incredibly sad because what good is stuff if you're dead? You can't use it anyway. And to think stuff was the only thing that kept her going back is absolutely tragic. One friend would come out to say that Maria confided in her that she didn't want to go into hiding because that would mean giving up Judith's career and everything that they worked for. Do, with, do what you will with that, I guess. To be fair, there are millions of reasons why people don't leave these kinds of relationships or these kinds of situations. And I'm never going to speak ill of the victims. But if this is the truth, it's so incredibly disheartening. Maria's stepdaughter, Aggie, remembers a conversation with Maria where she tells her that they've worked so hard for this house and if anyone's going to leave, it's going to be her father. Joseph's friend Peter recalls a conversation with Joseph where he tells him that he's going to unalive Maria. When the friend says, what about Judith? He replies, I have to get rid of her as well. Peter would later say that he thought that these were just empty threats, things that people would say when they're mad, and that he never believed that his friend would actually follow through on any of it. June 10th, 1988. Judith turns 10 years old. July 25th, 1988. That morning was a beautiful morning. Judith is outside playing and riding her bike. That night, Maria puts Judith to bed. She goes to bed herself and she leaves Joseph alone and drunk on the couch. Okay, there's nothing unusual about this situation. This is the routine many nights at the Barcy home. But for some reason on this night, something inside of Joseph snaps. He waits for the two of them to fall asleep. Then he goes into his closet and he grabs his 32 caliber. He walks into Judith's room and he <sighs> in the head. She dies instantly. That noise wakes Maria, who knows what it is immediately, jumps out of her bed and runs towards her daughter. There's a struggle in the hallway. Joseph gets Maria to the ground, she, her in the head, and she dies immediately. For the next two days, Joseph lives in the home with the bodies. He never moves them, he never touches them, he just lives in the home with them. When Judith misses a recording session for All Dogs Go to Heaven, the studio calls the bar the studio calls Judith's agent who calls the Barcy home. Joseph answers the phone. He tells the agent that a black car came to pick them up that morning, but he doesn't know why and he doesn't know where they went. Then he goes on to tell the agent that he had already moved out of the house and that he just came by to say goodbye to his little girl. Why would you even... 
why would you even share that information? Like, it makes no sense. Why would you even share information like that? I would just say, well, first of all, I wouldn't do that. But I would either not answer the phone or I would have left it at, I don't know, the car came to pick him up. I have no idea. July 27th, 1998, at around 8 o'clock in the morning. A neighbor of the bar sees a woman named Eunice is outside watering her garden where she, when she hears an explosion coming from the Barcy home. She looks and she sees smoke pouring out of the home. So she calls 911. After firefighters put out the blaze, they're able to piece everything together. That morning... Joseph poured some type of accelerant on both Judith and Maria and lit them both on fire. Then he walked into the garage and he unalived himself with his gun. On August 9th, 1988, Judith and Maria were buried next to each other in unmarked graves. It wouldn't be until 2013 when a number of Judith's loyal fans would all pitch in to purchase a headstone for Judith and Maria. As for Joseph, I don't know where he is. I don't care. Hopefully somebody tossed his body in a fire, watched it burn, then dumped him in a landfill. Fast forward. Judith's home is featured on a house flipping show called Murder House Flip where the new owners of the home claim that the house is haunted. Then Tyler Henry from Hollywood Medium claims to be speaking to Judith during a reading for Tracy Gold, who is Judith's co-star on the sitcom Growing Pains. So Judith plays the child version of Tracy Gold on the show. And after Judith and Maria's death, Tracy put her funeral together and her sister did, Tracy's sister did the eulogy. So when she comes through, she comes through, she's saying Joseph did it, Joseph did it. She's saying, um, I don't blame my mother because my mother was trying to get us out of the situation. She talks about the fire and she thinks Tracy Gold for the funeral and the eulogy. Okay. Whether you believe in mediums or not is completely up to each individual person. I'm a believer. I was actually a non-believer until I went to one myself and they told me things that nobody could possibly know. Um, if you're interested, I would go watch it. If I remember, I'll link it down below for you guys. It's really, really good. Really, Joseph's son... Barna would unalive himself in 1995 and his daughter Aggie would pass away from breast cancer in 1997. So just absolute tragedy all around for this poor family and everybody that is associated with the garbage that was Joseph Barcy. I would think it's both of their faults. So Marika and Joe. There, it, it, it took two people to do this. But poor little Judy, she had nothing to do with the whole thing. I truly believe in my heart, and this is why I think I can get through this. That Judy now is really in a happy place, and I'll probably start crying. Um, but I do, I believe she's in a really happy place right now. And she always wanted to go somewhere where people were happy. And so I believe now that she's in her magic kingdom and she's happy. She really is happy. She always wanted to be in life for her. It's got to be better now. All right, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and I appreciate you so, so, so very much. Please like, subscribe, and comment if you haven't yet. And you feel so inclined to because it really helps me out. And until next time, stay safe out there.